so I wanted to thank everybody uh, for your interest and support of our programs um, uh, that we do for the community here. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, our guest tonight is Scott Eyman, who is a respected film scholar and researcher who has written best-selling books about some of the major directors, producers, and stars of early 20th, uh, 20th century Hollywood. He has written 15 books. Among them, he has co-authored Robert Wagner, three installments to date of the actor's memoirs. He has written biographies of John Wayne and Mary Pickford, and he's produced major studies of Cecil B. DeMille, uh, Louis B. Mayer, and John Ford. He is the former book editor and art critic of the Palm Beach Post and a frequent reviewer for the Wall Street Journal. He's been awarded the William K. Everson Award for Film History by the National Board of Review, and he teaches film history at the University of Miami. Mr. Iman's expertise on the history of Hollywood's golden age informs all of his work, but great researchers and scholars do not necessarily write compelling books. Lucky for us, he is also a superb narrative writer with the ability to craft disparate interviews and research about his subjects into a compelling story. He's done that in Hank and Jim, the 50-year relationship, friendship of Henry Fonda and James Stewart. Yes, you will learn a lot about the history of Hollywood during this period, about the studio system, about the relationship between Americans and what they wanted to see in their film stars, and about how that changed and about how the actors changed over the years. The context and cast of characters is rich. But this book works ultimately because it is a deeply human story, poignant at times, as the author traces for us the history of two careers and the arc of two lives. From the beginning, we are presented with a mystery. How could two such different people be lifelong friends? Mr. Iman explains what held that seemingly improbable relationship together. But in the process of getting us there, the reader comes to understand more intimately the nature of each man. We get to go behind the screen image and see who they each were as individuals. You can't go back to watching either actor, either actor on the screen again without um, what you have come to learn about them in Hank and Jim enriching their performances. And that seems exactly what a book like this should do. Please join me in welcoming Scott Iman to the Burbank Public Library. Thank you so much for that un unusually graceful introduction. L uh, listing uh, uh, my credits like that, I'm, I'm exhausted just thinking about it. Part of the reason was I'd never written this book before, uh, which is you know, a fairly good excuse to doing a book. The more important reason was that I'd never read a book like this either. Uh, Today, the motion picture, the show business community is completely decentralized. Everybody works everywhere. Sometimes you're in Vancouver, sometimes you're in New York, sometimes you're in Paris. You're all over the globe. You go where the work is for whatever venue, whether it's a, a motion picture or a cable production or uh, a television, whatever it is. You're just constantly in motion because in this era, uh, 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 directors and actors are essentially migrant workers. In the period I write about, in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, and even into the 50s, show business was centralized. If you were in the theater, you basically worked in New York or you went out on tour. But even tours were cast centrally in, in New York. In the motion picture business, you worked in California. You worked in Los Angeles. That was just the way it was. So if you made a, a, a connection with somebody while working, while me meeting someone at a party, you could actually sustain a, fr a friendship, a relationship because you saw each other on a regular basis. It wasn't you were constantly ships passing in the night, as it is today. Um, I had read, we've all read books about a, a, a deep, deep friendships between politicians, between Churchill and Roosevelt, for instance, or between uh, 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 John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, for instance. But there really aren't any books about the deep friendship between two great American acting icons until this. <laughs> so I nominated myself, as I often immodestly do. Um, they met briefly 
1930. Jimmy Stewart was an architecture student at Princeton. Uh, and Henry Fonda was a young leading man in a kind of a raggedy theatrical troupe called the University Players. The leading lady of the University Players was a young actress named Margaret Sullivan. Stewart was an architecture student at Princeton, uh, and he was a member of the Triangle Club, the Dramatic Society at Princeton University. They had hired Margaret Sullivan to come up and perform in a play that the Triangle Club was doing. And Fonda wisely didn't want to let her out of his sight, so he followed her to Princeton for the show, for this weekend of shows. They met, uh, they shook hands, and that was the end of it. Neither one of them thought anything of, the, uh, of it at the moment. Two years later, in 1932, uh, the university players had exploded. Uh, it was the pit of the Depression. Fonda and Sullivan had married, finally. That lasted about four months. They divorced, uh, and Fonda was thrown into a deep, deep funk and quit the acting business, uh, temporarily, obviously. Uh, Stewart had, been, had joined the University Players after Fonda had left the University Players because of the divorce. Uh, and they were both equally unemployed in New York City in the autumn of 1932, which was not a great time to be unemployed in New York City because it was the pit of the Depression. Uh, uh, unemployment was uh, spiking at 25%. Now, if you all remember, as I'm sure you do, the unpleasantness of the real estate crash 10 years ago when unemployment hit 10% and people were running around uh, like the sky was falling, you can imagine what the, uh, the response must have been amongst the public and industry when unemployment was at 25% in 1932. So everybody was desperate. And Stewart and Fonda and a young director named Joshua Logan basically threw in together in order to save money on rent. Uh, the, the, uh, the apartment house was on West 64th, where uh, Lincoln Center is now. Uh, basically, the way it worked was whoever was working and actually contributing some money to the general overhead got the bed. <laughs> whoever wasn't working got the couch. Uh, for reasons no one ever could adequately explain, the stove was in the hallway. Uh, it was, uh, Fonda called it casa gangrene because they could never get the, sm the mildew smell out of the apartment. It was, it was rough, but it was 1932 and they were all 22 years old or 24 years old and the world was in front of them and as Fonda said, we barely recognized the depression because uh, we were just trying to get a job in the theater. Uh, it was at this period that they bonded and there was a, a kind of circulating frat house cast of characters that came through this, this apartment. Besides Logan and Stewart and Fonda, there was a young actor named Burgess Meredith who you may have heard of. Uh, there was another actor named Myron McCormick, uh, who was the original Luther Billis in South Pacific and uh, 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 played Paul Newman's manager in The Hustler. Myron McCormick died young. He was only in his 50s when he died. But he always had the face of an elderly man, even when he was young. So everybody thought, oh, that's too bad. He was an old guy. Actually, he wasn't. Uh, but he, they, they, were all, they were all thrown together by circumstance. And, and the bonds that they formed, all these guys formed, remained with them all their lives. Uh, Stewart and Fonda roomed together for three years until 1935. They developed a hobby of building model airplanes. Uh, they would carve the planes out of balsa wood. Uh, Fonda would be in charge of painting the planes. Stewart would be in charge of, of the ballast, of uh, applying uh, uh, little pieces of clay to the wings for maximum lift. Uh, it was a classic division of labor. They wouldn't allow anybody in the apartment to clean it because after a performance, when one of them was working, they would come home at 11 o'clock at night, 11.30 at night, and they'd be all charged up from acting, and they couldn't sleep. This is the, one of the problems of being an actor. You don't really get to sleep until 3 or 4 in the morning because you're, you know, uh, uh, your juices are still flowing from the performance. And that's when they would work on the planes, between the end of the performance and getting home and finally getting tired. Uh, in 1935, Fonda was uh, assigned by Hollywood uh, and started making movies. And uh, six months later, Stewart was signed by MGM and also came out. And as before, Stewart moved in with Fonda at a house they rented in Brentwood. Uh, and there they stayed for two more years uh, uh, with, again, Burgess Meredith passing through and Joshua Logan passing through and Myron McCormick passing through. Uh, then Fonda got married for the second time to Frances, is the, the mother of Peter and Jane Fonda. Uh, 
uh, a few years, they both became stars basically at the same point in the late 30s, Fonda with uh, uh, Tom Joad and The Grapes of Wrath, and Young Mr. Lincoln for John Ford, two pictures for John Ford, Stewart with uh, You Can't Take It With You for Frank Capra, and The Philadelphia Story for George Cukor, and The Shop Around the Corner for Ernst Lubitsch. Uh, and then comes World War II. They both go into the service. Uh, Stewart's drafted. Uh, he's been flying a plane by this time for three years. He had his own plane by 1937. Uh, and in spite of the fact that he was an experienced pilot with about 300, three or 400 hours in the air, uh, the Air Force rejected him because he was six foot four, weighed 140 pounds, and couldn't make the weight requirement. <laughs> so it, 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 instead of uh, uh, pulling strings to get out of the service, he pulled strings to get into the service and get the weight requirement lifted. Uh, Fonda enlisted in the Navy after Pearl Harbor. Uh, Stewart flew 20 missions as a B-24 bomber pilot over Germany, over occupied France and Belgium. Uh, the, by the end of the war, he had, uh, uh, was in charge of his own bomber group. Had the war run another six or nine months, uh, he would have been, had probably had charge of an entire area. Uh, he was a superb pilot. Uh, his men loved him because he was lucky. There were a lot of pilots were skilled, but not a lot of pilots were lucky. Uh, occasionally, uh, uh, one of his planes in his sorties would get shot down. His plane never got shot down. He never lost a man on a plane, on one of his own planes. And he never, in fact, got wounded either. One time, a piece of shrapnel came up from the, through the bottom of the plane, through his legs, and out the roof. But it didn't touch him. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever sat in a B-24. They are incredibly small and tight and claustrophobic. And I'm not claustrophobic by nature, but sitting there, I just thought, how did he do this? Because you can't move. You can't breathe. And some of those bombing runs ran six and eight hours. And, and, it's, and the noise, because those things, it's like being inside a huge threshing machine, uh, it was an extraordinary experience. Fonda was in naval intelligence in the South Pacific. Uh, at the end of 1945, they got out of, of the service. They hooked up again at cl the 21 Club in New York City, uh, where uh, uh, Stewart proceeded to tell stories, not about World War II. He never would discuss World War II. There's two kinds of veterans, the ones that won't shut up and the ones that absolutely won't talk about it. Fonda was the latter. He would not talk about it, not to anybody. Um, but he told stories about Life Magazine wanted to do a story about Jimmy Stewart, the returning hero, coming home to Indiana, Pennsylvania. So they sent a photographer to Indiana, Pennsylvania. And there wasn't a lot of variety in the shots. So the photographer suggested, well, maybe we could go fishing. And Stewart said, oh, I'll, 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 OK, OK. What the photographer didn't know was Stewart had fished maybe once in his life. And he was not an outdoors man in any possible sense, the loosest sense of the word. It just, that wasn't who he was. But the photographer, he was always you know, trying to be helpful. Uh, and he was used to taking directions. So OK, he played a being fisherman. So they're in the boat, and he's trying to cast. And the photographer's behind him, and he casts backwards. And the hook landed right in the photographer's forehead and his eyebrow and stuck there. And he whacked the thing forward, except it didn't come out. And the photographer screamed. And the photography session ended. So they rushed back to the town to get a doctor to take the hook out of the poor guy's forehead. <laughs> so Stewart is telling this story at the 21 Club to Fonda. And when Stewart told a story, it tended to get very elaborate and rococo and, and involved. And it took him like 20 minutes to tell the story about hooking the, putting the hook in the photographer's head. And Fonda literally slid under the table, screaming with laughter. It was like they'd never left. It was like they'd been together you know, for the whole four years. Um, they only had one argument in their entire friendship, which, as I said, ran 50 years. It was over politics. Stewart was a conservative Republican, probably from the time his mother's water broke. <laughs> Fonda was a, a liberal Democrat, probably from the time his mother's water broke. The seminal event in Fonda's youth was his witnessing of a lynching in the streets of Omaha. There was a black man who had supposedly done something to a white woman. Uh, a mob gathered. They dragged him out of the jail. They hung him. Then they shot him full of holes. Then they cut him down and attached his corpse to uh, an automobile and dragged him around the town square in Omaha. And Fonda witnessed this. And from that point on, he had zero faith in uh, uh, human beings. He had always had, and you can see it kind of in his acting. There's kind of a residual distrust and a wariness.
in his personality as an actor. Um, but it inf and, and Stewart had nothing like that in his life. He never had that kind of, he had a, a Tom Sawyer boyhood in a small town in Pennsylvania. So they were, in a sense, opposed, uh, it, opposites in, in, in some respects. Uh, font, but, but there were a lot of instances in which they were quite similar. They were both loners, for instance. They didn't have a lot of people in their lives. They didn't want a lot of people in their lives. Even when they were starving young actors, if they had four or five friends, that was just fine. That was fine. Um, they saw their craft exactly the same way. Uh, learn the lines, back and forward. Respect the script, otherwise, why do it? Respect the other actor, look the other actor in the eye. Don't take acting lessons, do it. Learn by doing. Neither one of them had an acting lesson. In time, Jane Fonda became a method actress. And Hank and Jane did a show together as a benefit for the Omaha Playhouse where he began acting. And she uh, uh, was supposed to walk on stage winded and upset. So she had the stage manager rough her up a little. And Fonda's looking at this thinking, what's the point of acting? It's, uh, it's about pretending. It's not about actually being. Uh, winded and out of breath and upset. It's, it's pretending. Acting is pretending. It's being truthful in an untruthful situation. So they were just, they never really got, Jane and, and Hank never really got along as actors. They simply saw the profession in, in very different ways. But Fonda and Stewart actually absolutely saw the profession in the same way. Uh, their only argument was over politics because of their different things, different orientations. It was 1947. And the House on American Activities Committee was getting warmed up. And at this point, uh, after the war, <laughs> Stewart had gotten out of uh, the Air Force and he'd come back to Hollywood, not particularly enthusiastically. No, neither of them really wanted to go back into the movie business. They had the usual issues that returning guys who have been in combat, in Stewart's case, uh, or in the uh, seeing what Fonda had seen uh, in the South Pacific, the movie business seems childish after going through something like that. But Stewart's house had been subleased while he was in, at war, and it had six months to go. So he did what he always did. He moved in with Fonda again. <laughs> he moved into the playhouse Fonda had built for Jane and Peter Fonda. And they, Jane and Peter moved into the guest room at the house on Tiger Tail Road uh, 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 up above Bel Air. Um, but they argued about politics in 1947, and it got heated, very heated. Uh, and at some point in the argument, they, they both stopped because they realized that the, the weight they placed on their friendship was more important than the weight they placed on their political ideology. So they agreed to disagree, and they never spoke about politics again as long as they lived, ever. In the 60s and early 70s, when Jane went to Vietnam, went to North Vietnam, and her political activities took precedence over her acting activities, reporters would bait Stewart. What do you think about your godchild? What do you think about what your godchild's doing? What do you think about what your godchild just said about <laughs> Vietnam? He never took the bait. I'm sure he was appalled by what she was doing. Stewart lost a child in Vietnam. His son, Ronald, was killed. He was a Marine, and he got shot. He got a machine, took a machine gun bolt in the chest and died. I'm sure he was appalled, but he would never take the bait because that would not only have upset his granddaughter, his, his, his godchild, who to this day refers to him as Uncle Jimmy, but would have upset Fonda, Hank, which he would not do under any circumstances. Um, I thought I'd read from the beginning of the book, which kind of places their, their relationship uh, as it was at the end of, of Henry Fonda's life in 1982. In the end, as in the beginning, they didn't need words. Hank's health broke first. The pacemaker had been implanted while he was playing Clarence Darrow in 1975, and that was followed by a tumor the size of a grapefruit in his diaphragm. The tumor was benign, but the surgery resulted in a troublesome staph infection. Prostate cancer was diagnosed in 1979 when he was appearing in the first Monday in October. The cancer moved into the bone, but doses of estrogen sent the disease into remission. After that came various hip and back problems. His frailty was obvious. In 1980, when he wanted to make Gideon's trumpet for television, the only way he could be insured was to uh, pay part of the premiums himself, which he did without much complaint. <laughs> 
Clarence Gideon was a good part, and a good part meant more to Hank Fonda than bread, than air. Retire? I wouldn't know what to do, he said, dismissing the very idea. Finally, it rounded back to the heart again, which was descending into congestive failure. Before, he'd always rallied, if only because dying was bound to interrupt acting. But this time, the doctors and the family weren't so confident. He was in intensive care. His wife, Shirley, remembers that things were looking grim until Jim Stewart came for a visit. Fonda had been in a deep sleep, but when he heard Jim's unmistakable voice, he began to stir. Stewart, he said, is that you? S assured that it was, Fonda opened his eyes. It was definitely Jim standing there. Where's my root beer float, Fonda asked. At that point, everybody in the room knew that he was going to live for a while longer, because Henry Fonda took root beer floats very seriously. Another thing he took seriously was Jim Stewart, his best friend. By the time Fonda won his ridiculously overdue Oscar for On Golden Pond, he was in a wheelchair. He'd acted right up until his body failed him. If I go, he told his wife, I go with my boots on. By the early summer of 1982, he was clearly spiraling down. On May 16th, he celebrated his 77th birthday. It had been precisely 139 days since his last release from Cedar sinai Medical Center, where he resided for seven weeks. Shirley had been keeping track. Cedars had been his 13th hospitalization since their marriage in 1965. If anybody noticed the unlucky number, they didn't mention it. Hank hadn't left the house since his daughter Jane had brought him his Oscar right after the ceremony. Some days he didn't leave his bedroom. The skin around his face had begun to tighten and fade, which had the effect of making his startlingly blue eyes loom larger. The rest of him had aged terribly, but his eyes remained radiant and fierce with life. Every day, Stewart would leave his house on North Roxbury in Beverly Hills and visit his friend up the hill in Bel Air. Most days, he would bring flowers in one hand and a bag of vegetables in the other, harvested that morning from the garden he and Gloria had planted next to their house. If Fonda was awake and in the mood for conversation, they usually discussed gardening and the pleasure it gave them. When Jim wasn't around, Jane would sit by her father's bed. Her hope was that he would talk, say something that might dispel the aura of silence and grudge that had plagued their relationship since she was a little girl. But in his dying, as in his living, Henry Fonda kept his own counsel, reserving his thoughts about death to himself. When I die, put my ashes in the compost pile, he had told Shirley. It was the sort of defiant statement that people often make, but Fonda meant it. If there's anything an organic gardener understands, it's the importance of quality fertilizer. <laughs> As Jim sat with Hank that long summer, they figured out that the fall of 1982 would mark 50 years since they'd thrown in together, two starving young actors in New York City. Since then, they'd been inseparable, emotionally if not physically. On the surface, their friendship was a match of opposing personalities. Henry James Fonda was an agnostic, tending towards atheistic who had been raised in a Christian science household on the plains of Nebraska. James Maitland Stewart was a church-going Presbyterian from the archetypal Midwestern town of Indiana, Pennsylvania. Hank was an ardent New, De New Deal Democrat, Jim an equally serious conservative Republican. Hank had had five wives, a fact he found mortifying, and often difficult relationships with his children, while Jim had one wife and was adored by his children. Stewart had been finishing his architecture degree at Princeton when he was diverted into the least likely career ever attempted by a native of Indiana, Pennsylvania. Fonda was introduced to the craft by Dorothy Brando, whom everybody called Doe, an Omaha wife and mother with a bad marriage and a drinking problem, who also nudged her son Marlon into the profession. Hank lived most of his life like a tightly wound spring, and his acting followed suit. As one critic noted, he tended to project anger over affirmation. He's almost always more convincing and attractive and memorable when at odds with something, the situation, the community, himself. He could relax only with a few close friends, for a long time with John Ford and his crew of reprobates, always with Stuart, Johnny Swope, or Leland Hayward. Stuart was apparently comfortable in life or at work. One actress said that if you happened to turn your back and just listen to him talking, you couldn't tell if he was playing a scene or having a conversation with someone on the set. He was that natural, that at ease. What set Stewart apart from the other leading men of his generation was his embrace of emotional extremes, pain connected to nothing less than unmediated existential agony. 
Stewart was regarded with open affection by the communities of Hollywood and movie fans alike. He was practically a member of the extended family of man. Nobody called Fonda Hank, except close friends or family, but millions of people who never met Stewart referred to him as Jimmy. In spite of their many differences, these unusually tall, skinny, gifted young actors had bonded immediately over their shared passion for their work and for an ethereal young actress named Margaret Sullivan. Both of them worked with her. Fonda loved her and married her, then lost her. Stuart pined for her. Through all the vicissitudes of the world, through career ups and downs, through their mutual jettisoning of their careers to go to war and the difficult, adjustment, the past, the difficult adjustments that came after, they'd stayed close taking care to steer carefully past the shoals of their differing politics. And now Jim was doing the only thing he could for his pal. He sit there while Hank struggled to stay awake, struggled to breathe, struggled to stay alive for one more hour, one more day. Dying is hard work, and Henry Fonda was exhausted. Besides discussions of gardening and periods of companionable silence, there was occasional yelling about episodes from their shared youth. Stewart was about 100% deaf, while Fonda's hearing loss was about 50%. Each of them had to shout in order to be heard by the other. This scene that had unaccountably not appeared in a play by Samuel Beckett struck Hank as hilarious. Uh, his sense of humor encompassed the bleak, while Jim could manage only a thin smile at their shared decrepitude. Sometimes they talked about the model of a Martin bomber they built together in New York, and that Jim had dragged across the country so that they could fly it together in Hollywood. What was missing from the conversation was any discussion of acting, at which they both excelled, or the movies, which granted them immortality. In so many ways, these men had parallel lives. Each was an actor before he became a star, and they remained actors after they became legends. Each of them embodied Americans, America's geographic as well as moral center, integrity mixed with a bloody-minded obstinance that wasn't acting. Beneath the placid surface, Stewart's emotions churned, while Fonda had the stillest center of any American actor, as eloquent in his isolation as a painting by Edward Hopper. He adamantly refused to show the machinery at work, which constituted his triumph as an actor, as well as his blockage as a husband or father. Fonda would always be indelibly identified with Tom Joad, the dispossessed ghost in the American darkness. That said, he was equally expert at playing bastards, he lunged for the part of a martinet in Ford Apache because John Ford wanted him. And sometimes, as in The Wrong Man for Hitchcock, or Once Upon a Time in the West for Sergio Leone, Fonda created something truly startling, an impassivity that barely masked crushing guilt in the case of the former, bottomless evil in the latter. <coughs> Fonda was a closet intellectual and perfectionist, which inevitably meant he carried around a residual sense of disappointment with himself and others that could quickly ascend to seething impatience. If he attempted something, even if it was only a hobby, he had to achieve excellence. He did it with his gardening, his needlepoint, and especially with his painting. Stewart was far more easygoing. He didn't read much, was outwardly affable, rarely lost his temper. But on the deepest level, they shared one crucial characteristic. They were both loners, sparing with the gift of intimacy, reserving themselves for themselves. Once, an actor complained to John Ford that although he'd worked with Stewart several times, he still didn't know the man. Ford replied, you don't get to know Jimmy Stewart. Jimmy Stewart gets to know you. And now, suddenly, incomprehensibly, they were two hard of hearing old men who cherished their differences every bit as much as their shared memories. Hank had good days when he was fully present, followed by bad days when his energy faded and he stayed inside himself. He'd grown a beard out of defiance. I made a pact with myself that only when I am well will I shave it off, which I'm almost ready to do. The beard, which had been perhaps an inch long when he got his Oscar, was now bushy. When he felt up to it, he would sit in his favorite chair with a large sketch pad in his lap and draw. In the morning light, he looked uncannily like the elderly, emaciated Auguste Renoir. It was only right that Jim be there while Hank was dying. He'd been there when Hank was acting, been there when Hank was courting his wives. They'd lived together, double dated together, starred in movies together, designed immeasurably complex practical jokes together. They had so much to remember. That's the beginning of the book. Um, 12 years before Fonda died, 1970. They went a Western together called uh, the Cheyenne Social Club. 
directed by Gene Kelly. Because, of course, if you're going to get direct a comedy western, who else would you get except Gene Kelly? The obvious choice. <laughs> anyway, uh, Stewart's son had died a, a couple months earlier, and he'd been devastated, and he wanted to back out of the film, but they couldn't get anybody else to play on such short notice to do the film. And he realized that if he backed out of the film, the film was going to get canceled, and he didn't want to do that and put everybody out of work. So he thought, well, maybe the work will help. Maybe it'll get, help me get over this. So he showed up in Santa Fe for the location work. Now, since 19... 50, Stewart had ridden one horse in Westerns, one horse and one horse only. It was the only horse he would ride. The horse's name was Pie. Uh, Stewart and he had this relationship. He could explain to the horse what the horse needed to do. Now, you were gonna, you're going to walk to the edge of the saloon. You're going to stop. You're going to take a beat and then turn your head to the right. <laughs> and, the, and the crew and the director are just rolling their eyes thinking he's out of his mind. You, you don't, that's not how you talk to a horse to get the horse to do it. You, you don't talk to the horse at all. Uh, but Stewart said, no, 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 he'll, he'll, he'll do it. Believe me, I, he'll, he's, he knows exactly what I want him to do. I just have to explain it to him. Okay, Jim, <laughs> fine. And the act, director would call action, and the horse, Stewart's on the horse, and the horse would walk to the edge of the saloon, stop, and then turn around and look, put his head over here. Cut. Nobody could understand how Stewart could get him to do it, but that's the relationship he and the horse had. <laughs> Pi was now over 20 years old, and they started to bring him from California to Santa Fe. And Santa Fe is over 6,000 feet up in uh, 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 elevation. And as the tractor bringing him got higher and higher, Pi began to have trouble breathing. So they had to stop and get veterinary care for the horse twice, getting him from California to New Mexico. So they get the horse to Santa Fe, outside Santa Fe, and the it's clear that the horse can't work. He can, he's okay if he's just standing in the corral or, or, or not doing anything, but any activity threatened to send him into uh, 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 terrible lung problems and breathing problems. So not only had Stewart's son died, the horse that he depended on to use in a Western was suddenly too old to work. So he's in very bad shape. He's, he comes to the set in the mornings. His eyes are red from crying overnight. He's not sleeping. Fonda didn't know what to do. They tr tried ta telling stories about when they were kids in New York together, and, and, and Stuart would basically kind of just listen and occasionally throw a thought in, but he wasn't really responding. He wasn't hitting the ball back over the net. Now, Fonda was a very skilled artist in the style of Andrew Wyeth, uh, a beautiful draftsman, very skilled artist. And uh, he would give his paintings away, but his paintings were really good. He had gallery shows, actually, a lot of gallery shows. They're excellent. And he realized there was only, he didn't know what else to do, so he would take his sketch pad down to the uh, corral at lunchtime where Pi was. And the horse was OK as long as they didn't ask him to do anything. And he started doing sketches of Pi, his head, his body, the corral, uh, uh, the barn in the background. They finish the location work. They go back to California to finish uh, the picture. And they're it's about two or three weeks later, there's a knock on Stewart's door on Roxbury, where Stewart lived for his entire married life, for his entire life almost. Uh, and it's Fonda, and he's got a painting you know, with covered in brown wrapping paper about yay. And he says, I, I, I made you something. I hope you like it. He handed it to Stewart, and he turned around and walked away. Stewart closes the door tears the paper off, and it's a beautiful oil portrait of Pi. The horse is standing crosswise to the viewer, but his head is turned, looking at, at you. Uh, and he's got this very intelligent, appraising look in his eye, the way certain animals get, as if to say, are you worth my time? How bright are you, you know? And his front, one, one uh, hoof is crossed over the other one, which was a characteristic pose that the horse would go into when he was relaxed. And it's a really lovely painting. And Stuart was so moved. He, he, he hung the painting in his living room with a light on it that would never turned off 24 hours a day for the rest of his life. In time, uh, Stuart's wife, di Fonda died. Stuart's wife died first, which stunned him because she was 10 years younger than he was. And he always assumed that he would die first because, let's face it, men usually die first. Uh, and he never saw it coming. And he was devastated. And he essentially, at that point, retreated from life. 
uh, he would take his meals in his bedroom. He'd watch television all day. He really he stopped seeing people other than his children. And even then, his daughter Kelly said, after 45 minutes or an hour, it was clear he was just not interested anymore. This went on for 10 years. He was waiting to die. Eventually, he did. He was 89 years old when he died. His son, Michael, today has the portrait of Pi in his living room with a light on it 24 hours a day. It never goes out. So in a sense, the, the mutual devotion between those two men transcended their lives, transcended their deaths, was passed on to their family members who honor it even today. As I said, for Peter and Jane, Fonda, James Stewart is Uncle Jimmy. They don't refer to him any other way. Uh, and Fonda's devotion to Stewart is, is manifest in that painting, and it's manifest in the care with which his son tends it. <laughs>